infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to the latest podcast of Outbreak News Interviews. Now, mosquito-borne viruses that infect humans, the numbers are plenty. Of course, we have Zika and Dengue, Chikungunya, West Nile, and Keystone virus. Well, University of Florida researchers discuss the first human case of Keystone virus in a recent issue of Clinical Infectious Diseases. Here to talk more about this arbovirus and the first human case is Dr. John Lednitsky, Ph.D. Dr. Lednitsky is a research professor in the UF College of Public Health and Health Professions, Department of Environmental and Global Health, and a member of the Emerging Pathogens Institute. He is also the first author of the report. Dr. Lednitsky, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. So before we get into the paper, uh, a little basic virology. Um, what kind of virus is Keystone, and what are some of its viral relatives that the audience may be familiar with? Keystone virus is uh, commonly referred to as a Bunya virus. More specifically, it's an orthobunya virus from the Peribunyaviridae family. It's uh, one of those viruses that we don't know very much about. Some relatives that some people might be more familiar with are things like Jamestown Canyon virus, which is pretty prevalent in the United States, and La Crosse virus. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what's the mosquito vector for this uh, virus? It is thought that the common vector is EBS. Atlanticus tormentor, and you, you can guess from the name tormentor that these are mosquitoes that um, <laughs> like to bite. <laughs> sure. And um, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Leniski, can we uh, spend a few moments and give us a little bit of history on Keystone virus, when and where it was first found, uh, what's its geography in the U.S.? And uh, what type of animals do we see this in? Yeah, those are very interesting questions because uh, this is one of those viruses that we have to re-explore. We don't really know that much about the natural biology. But it was first isolated uh, in Keystone, Florida, which is uh, near Tampa Bay in 1964. From this, it was isolated from mosquitoes. And studies done long ago uh, disclose that it's found all the way from Chesapeake Bay all the way to Texas. So its distribution is quite wide. And we know it's still in circulation because as recently as 2005, in, in a study that was performed, it was isolated it was once again in the Tampa Bay area. But we don't know its greater distribu uh, distribution right now because, frankly, no one's really looking. Um, can you talk a little bit about, well, more than a little bit, about the case in the paper? Um, what is the story behind the case? This is actually a very interesting case. So what happened was there was a teenager, 16 years old at the time, who had recently moved to Florida. And he was in band camp, marching band camp. And the uh, practices were going on towards uh, during the late summer. And they would go on until 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. And all the kids were getting bitten by mosquitoes, even though they had sprayed themselves with um, things like DEET and mm -hmm. um, similar things. Now... The day before he had a rash, 
he complained about being very hot. I mean, he thought it was just an initially hot day. And he had been carrying around his um, band instrument for hours on end. And he said he had muscle aches and joint pains, which he thought was from all that marching around with an instrument. And he had uh, ankle pains. And they had just been given new band marching shoes. And he thought the shoes hadn't been broken into, uh, broken in. And so he attributed the ankle pain to that. Now, the following day, he had a rash that was not itchy. And his eyes were red. And um, everybody assumed it was an allergy. They gave him anti allergy medications, Benadryl. He didn't respond to that. And um, he went to a physician, and they couldn't figure out what he had. So at first they thought it was allergy, and then they thought he had mononucleosis, even though he didn't have any of the symptoms of mononucleosis. Mm -hmm. they, they did a quick mono test that was negative. They checked his spleen, was uh, not enlarged, and he was discharged as the uh, mystery patient today. <laughs> and we just so happened to be at the right place at the right time. And I had been studying uh, arboviruses, and it was very curious. I got the samples the same day that we at the University of Florida were having a Zika meeting, and everybody assumed perhaps this was the first case of Zika here in, in uh, Gainesville, Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did some Zika virus tests and checked for dengue and so, so forth and so on, and those were all negative. And so then the samples went to the freezer until they were worked on <laughs> after that. So... How did you finally diagnose this? Um, I mean, how did you pick out Keystone virus out of all the possible viruses? The one thing my laboratory does that few, few labs actually do nowadays is we actually try to grow the virus using cultured cells. Mm -hmm. And because I have a project looking at these mosquito-borne viruses in Haiti and different other countries, we just happen to have um, a big bank of different cells that we routinely try to infect with clinical samples. And it was through that where something grew up. And when we did our, when we did the test that we routinely do for all the viruses that were known to be in circulation in Haiti and Florida and so forth, so we tested for dengue, chicken gunia virus, Zika, and so forth and so on. Everything was coming up um, negative. So to identify the virus, I have a molecular method called unbiased sequencing. And it was through there that we got our first clue when we looked at the sequence that it, it was keystone virus. And we afterwards that uh, obtained a full genome sequence and indeed it was keystone virus now is this is this a virus that they look for with the sentinel chicken program uh i don't think so yeah and um, it's it's not uh clear if the virus actually will grow in chickens. It's known to infect mammals, mm -hmm. but uh, I haven't seen any good uh, recent work with regard to uh, growing in chickens. Mm -hmm. now, now, there's only been one human case that we know of. Um, what can you tell us about the pathology? How, how severe can this be? Uh, you're asking a really good question. Now, uh, I'll take this back. A few years back, they said about 20% of the people in Tampa had antibodies to this virus. So we'll, we'll assume it's, it's, it's at one time, maybe even still now, it, it was a virus that commonly 
affect the, the local population. But you don't hear uh, reports of, of local clusters or outbreaks of some mysterious thing. This particular patient had a rash, and when he went to the doctor, there was no fever, and the muscle ache and joint pain was gone, and he continued uh, his band practice as if there was nothing wrong other than for that rash. So in his case, um, other than the cosmetic appearance of the rash, there didn't seem to be much of anything else going on. Whether that's true for all people, I have no idea. And and we have to think about Zika. Most people who are infected with Zika virus have no idea, right? 80% sure. mm-hmm. don't even know they're sick. Right. And we don't know if that's the case with this particular virus. Um. So I guess that leads to my next question is, how common do you think this really is? Really good question. I have no idea. Yeah. And, uh, the, again, the older test suggests it was relatively common, at least in uh, north central Florida. Those are things that have to be repeated. Um, I would like you know, to look into it. Right now, we don't have funding to look in, into something like that because there's there's really no way there uh, there's no mechanism available here in the U.S. to look into things that you know haven't caused a real big problem yet. Mm-hmm. So, good question. I'd love to follow up on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, now that it's been found in a in a human being. Um, how concerned are you? Uh, good question. Right now, I'm not concerned yet. And I say that because, um, you know, going back, there, were, there was a 20% zero positivity in the inhabitants of Tampa. And the thing I, I really should point out is this kid who had it had moved from the Midwest to Florida. And so all the other kids from Florida were getting bitten by mosquitoes and nothing happened to them, probably because they were exposed to the virus when they were younger and they had the antibodies. That's my guess. Um, and, and then, you know, when the story came out, people started calling me up and saying that, well, my kid had a, uh, a rash and severe headache and blah, 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 blah. And, no one could figure out what was wrong. Um, so I don't know. It's it's a really dynamite question. Yeah. Well, clearly we're in the early stages of uh, finding out this kind of information. All right, yeah. Dr. Uh, Lednitsky, um, any final thoughts on Keystone, the, the work that you're doing, anything like that? There are a lot more of these viruses in Florida that we really need to be exploring. Those of us have kids, have all experienced that kids come home and they have a rash, they might have a slight fever. No one has the faintest idea what the kids have. And it's, it's, it could be that it's an allergy in some cases, but in some cases it might not be. Um, so these are things that we at the University of Florida are really interested in going after and uh you know we want to do more surveillance and find out if there are more of these viruses going around than uh we're generally aware of at this time well i want to thank you dr john leditsky for your time and expertise and congrats on the paper thank you very much if you are worried you have lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com.